and off we go. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Welcome to CNCF's live webinar, Modern CI CD with Tecton, Canico, and Customize. I'm Libby Schultz, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. We want to welcome our presenter, Jason Smith, an app modernization specialist at Google. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you will not be able to talk as an attendee, but there is a chat box where you can drop your questions on the right-hand side of the screen. Please feel free to put them there, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end, or if Jason prefers, during however you want your flow to go. Um, this is an official webinar of the CNCF, and as such, is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. And please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They are also available via your registration link. And the recording is also available on our online programs YouTube playlist under the CNCF channel. With that, I'll hand it over to Jason to kick it off. Thank you very much, Libby, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining on a early Tuesday morning. Well, not too early, but we'll uh, we'll learn some interesting things today. Why? Let's uh, jump right into this. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about modern CI/CD uh, with Tecton, Canico, and Customize, uh, as the title suggests. My name is Jason Smith. Some people know me as Jay. I respond to either. As mentioned, App Modernization Specialist over at Google Cloud. Uh, that's where you can find me on Twitter. You can see a little picture of me and my dog. And just uh, putting it out there, uh, forgive me if you hear barking in the background. She's still young and random noises cause her to go crazy. So we'll, 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 uh, we'll power through it. So let's look a little bit at our agenda here. We're gonna talk about the perfect tool, modern code pipelines, building the pipeline, maybe do a quick little demo and then Q&A. But let's first talk about this so-called perfect tool. I mean, we are all looking for the best tools for our job. You know, if you're a mechanic, contractor, something to that effect, doing some kind of construction, that perfect tool may be a hammer, screwdriver, uh, saw, any myriad of things. If you're a chef, perfect tool may be a whisk or some kind of futuristic technology like you see in Back to the Future where you just pop something in this microwave and it comes out and it's, it's a full cooked meal. Maybe that would be the perfect tool for a dream chef. But we're all looking for the perfect tool to do the job. One thing I see a lot of people talking about when we're when we're talking about cloud native, moving to the cloud, uh, moving our apps to the cloud, is we talk about you know how great it is to be on the cloud. We don't talk about how to actually use the cloud, how to deploy applications to the cloud in a way that is beneficial for the cloud. So what is that tool that will help us actually deploy modern applications? Well, the best tool for application design doesn't exist. Um, so I'm gonna give you guys back about 55 minutes. Thank you for your time. You know, not really. Um, not So what I usually get a lot of people asking me uh, either in my role or just in general, is everybody seems to want a solution, kind of a, a bundled solution for building code, for deploying code, that I can just kind of one click install, everything's good to go. What I usually find with a lot of these, a lot of these use cases is there's a lot of customization that tends to happen after the fact. So there really is no such thing as a perfect tool because every tool you deploy, you are going to have to do some, let's call it aftermarket uh, configurations. So you deploy it and now you're loading it up with shell scripts or just different types of commands. And sometimes I've seen people who are, myself included, I'm just as guilty as anybody else, who are just like, yeah, I don't even want to touch this code pipeline anymore because I'm pretty confident it'll be like a, a pile of Jenga bricks. And the minute I pull one out, the whole thing will collapse and nothing will work. <laughs> so what I usually say, instead of looking for the best tool, look for the best components and the best 
platform. What does this mean? Well, this means look for something that gives you the building blocks you need to build the best tool and that you can iterate on top of rather than trying to find the best tool and then trying to uh, tweak it. Because if you're going to wind up tweaking and customizing anyway, from my perspective, it's easier to start lower level than to try to customize on top of an opinionated system. Now, one great example of this whole platform component idea, I like to say is Kubernetes. Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a platform for building platforms. That's how I've always chosen to see it. You know, you hear a lot of people talk about how Kubernetes is the future. Kubernetes is the cloud. Kubernetes, you know, it, it's great. Everybody wants to use it. Let's containerize my apps, microservices, yada, yada, yada. And that's all true. But if, if somebody asked me to define what Kubernetes was in one phrase, it would be it's a platform filled with building platforms. It gives you a lot of different tools to run containers and that's because it gives you a lot of these different uh, declarative ways it ultimately became the de facto platform for running containers a lot of it is because it abstracts away the infrastructure you're able to declare you're still running on servers you're still running on nodes there's still a, a a kubernetes master you're still dealing with load balances we didn't get rid of those components we just abstracted it away and you're able to declare it in YAML files and then Kubernetes does its thing to make it work for you. So now I can build a lot of different things on top of Kubernetes in the cloud using traditional VMs, traditional uh, traditional objects really. So I've seen people do machine learning. I've seen people do, uh, do like a, a sentiment analysis, just a variety of different things on Kubernetes doing additional customizations. Uh, because the API is declarative, as we all know here, we are all Kubernetes users, and it's extensible. So you can create your own controllers, create your own objects, create your own CRDs. A lot of people have done that. We're, uh, I mean, if we just look at the ecosystem, and uh, apology, uh, apologies that this uh, is an eye test so early in the morning, I'm not going to ask you to read the smallest line. But this is just like a landscape of everything that is CNCF related um, as of a few days ago when I added the slide. Eh, for all I know, it probably changed, but this is just a collection of all the partners, projects, et cetera, that are part of Kubernetes. And a lot of it is because they were able to iterate on top of it. So you'll see some companies here that have been around for years and years and years, but they've been able to turn their product into something cloud native because Kubernetes gave them the API to essentially extend their application to be more cloud ready. So, but it's also not a magic bullet because you can't just throw something into the cloud and call it done. A lot of people just, I've seen a lot of people will come up to me and they'll say things like, um, oh, let's move to the cloud. Uh, well, we want to containerize our application, microservices. And then you start asking questions and then it's like, oh, okay, well, let's take a step back. Um, I don't think we've, we've thought this plan through yet. So Kubernetes isn't a magic bullet and you really shouldn't be thinking about your CIC pipeline as a magic bullet. You shouldn't be thinking, okay, well, I want this solution that's just going to make everything happy, going to make all of my developers happy, and whatnot. So let's now that we've covered a kind of a, a primer, if you will, talking about Kubernetes, talking about uh, best practices, talking about or talking about how Kubernetes is a platform for building platforms rather than just being the perfect platform. How do we build applications on it? Well, the way we build applications on it is we have to look at it the same way we look at Kubernetes and a platform for building platforms. So we want to build a code pipeline, but we want it to be declarative. We want to be able to iterate on it. We want to be able to templatize it. We want to be able to expand upon it as needed and make the changes with the, uh, the least amount of friction possible. So if we look at maybe a, just a very basic diagram, so we have uh, what our data center could look like, what the cloud could look like. We have the infrastructure, we have our servers, our nodes. We have Kubernetes, which is abstracting that away. We need a tool to abstract away the code deployment portion too, but we could build that on top of Kubernetes. So we have a tool called Tekton, or there is a tool called Tekton, it is open source. 
Uh, it is part of the CD Foundation, which you can probably call like a a, a, a partner uh, foundation to CNCF, or as they are both kind of subsidiaries of the Linux Foundation. It uses Kubernetes native components that are declarative, reproducible, and composable. Basically, everything ex is a uh, extension of Kubernetes. So everything you declare on Tecton is creating pods, it's creating containers, it is using Kubernetes components to do it. So if you know Kubernetes, you can figure out Tecton. There are event triggers for automatic automating build processes. So let's say if you want to create a trigger, if something is pushed to a specific Git repository with maybe a specific tag or on a specific branch, it needs to do X, Y, Z. But if it's on a different branch, do this. It comes with a concept called catalog, which is a bunch of reusable tasks and pipelines. We're going to dive into a little bit of what tasks and pipelines are. Uh, but basically, there are a lot of components that are going to be very similar, regardless of whether it's your pipeline, another company's pipeline, some project's pipeline, uh, something like maybe deployed to uh, Docker Hub or deployed to uh, whatever your, your repository is. Those will probably be pretty similar. No point in reinventing the wheel. There's a catalog of of common built tasks that you can just plug in your variables into your, your different parameters and there's a lot of products that are starting to integrate it so jenkins x comes uh, to mind k native as well which fun fact about this uh k native it's uh, it's it actually used to be part of k native as a product called k native build and then it really just kind of I guess a, a quick primer on that story is over time, people realized, oh, you know what? It, it It's so good. It shouldn't be limited to Knative. It should be something more. So it's spun out to be its own project called Tecton. Let's talk a little bit about what makes Tecton work. Now, Tecton, you know, isn't a single product. Like if you went to GitHub, and you looked at the Tecton project, you're not gonna just see one repository that has everything that you need. There's a bunch of different ones. You know, Obviously, there's some of the things like for the website and community and whatnot, but there's, uh, I would say, two major components, and that is the pipelines and the triggers. There are a few other ones, like there's a dashboard, there's a CLI, uh, and those are kind of self-explanatory, but let's talk a little bit about these other ones. So uh, a pipeline has, three primary components. There are obviously other ones, but let's talk about the primary ones. You have a step, which is a single operation in a CI CD workflow. So that could be like running PyTest on a, a Python application or running a build or some set effect. A task is a collection of those steps. And these are instantiated on a Kubernetes pod. So whenever a, a task is executed, it spins up a pod, completes uh, said task, and then spins that pod down. Now a pipeline is a collection of tasks in order. So once task A is complete, do task B. Once task B is complete, you know, so on and so forth. Trigger is the other component. Now trigger is the component for eventing, as I like to call it. So it's responding to an event in the world. Basically, it's res it's you you have these multiple components such as the event listener, which is essentially a CRD uh, that enables a declarative way to collect HTTP events with JSON payloads. So let's talk about GitLab, GitLab. Let's talk about GitHub. Let's talk about any Git repository, really. You know, you can set up webhooks to where when a specific event takes place, like a pull request or a push, it will then push to a specific endpoint to do something. So you can actually expose your event listener to the wide, you know, the World Wide Web, uh, set up a password or a security key. And whenever a certain event happens in your Git repository, it will, the, the webhook that in, within that Git repository can then trigger an event. And for what it's worth, it's not limited to Git repositories. Obviously that's the most common iteration because that's how we code. You know, we push code to our Git repo and then do our CI CD, but uh, there are other things you can use to trigger builds. Uh, then there's the trigger template. Now this is the re where you declare the resource for the trigger. So trigger, uh, so an event happens, uh, a, a git push happens, uh, and uh, there's new code on the main branch. 
so the, tr the trigger template is, okay, great. What are we going to do with that new code? What, what is the action that I want to take place? Build a task, build a pipeline. Do we want to push this code? Do we want to containerize it? And then trigger binding essentially binds the trigger template to the event listener. And it also can pass parameters from the JSON payload. So things like the Git repository URL or uh, the branch, things that are going to show up in that JSON payload, you can pull that out and essentially turn it into a variable and pass that along to the trigger template. And it's a little, you know, uh, you'll give access to the slides later. So if you can't see this, I apologize. Um, but basically, here's kind of an idea of what a task would look like. This is a build task. As you can see, there are two two main steps here: uh, the Canico one and the PyTest one. We'll dive a little deeper into what happens with the Canico one. It's actually pretty cool, and we'll talk about it. Uh, but as you can see here. It's, it, it looks like your standard Kubernetes object. You know, I'm calling the specific API. It's task kind, give it a name, the parameters, uh, resources. These are essentially inputs and outputs. So in this example, the input, this is the Git repository that it's going to be getting. Uh, and then the image is the name of the image that I want to be built, that I'm going to be pushing to my container registry. And of course, here you just define the, you declare the steps, you give it an image. Very important to point out, every step is its own container. And because of that, you can actually create incredibly intense uh, steps if you have like a very common thing. So you can see here, I'm using a Python container. I could pull that from anything, run PyTest, good to go. And then you're also able to pass along arguments, as you can see, just kind of like standard PyTest arguments. But let's say I have a very niche use case that there isn't a current container that exists, or Perhaps uh, there is a container that exists, but it's kind of 80% of the way there. I need to add a few extra lines, a few extra features to it in order for it to work. That's fine. You can put whatever container you want in the image file there, and that container can be its own step. So when I say building, like be having the components to build what you need, this is exactly what I'm talking about. You're able to actually build your own step your own job if you want to do a specific type of uh, analysis as part of the pipeline you're able to do that and then here kind of is a pipeline so as you can see it takes in the resources so it passes along a get image it passes along a, a name uh or an, i'm sorry it passes along git it passes along the image variables parameters then we actually give the we all we list the different tasks that are part of the pipeline in order, and this is what it does. So here we have our build tasks. I have a separate task called deploy, which does like the push to K Kubernetes. I mentioned Canico a little bit. Now, one thing a lot of us have probably had to deal with is building Docker images, and how do we do that? Most of us, I probably do Docker build or. Podman build or, or whatever tool it is we want to use. But ultimately, it boils down to I need to have some kind of CLI on a machine that is running some kind of uh, uh, Docker image or Docker machine, whatever tool I'm wanting to use, run that command, and then do the push. So spinning up VMs just to do that. Canico is an interesting project that is open source and governed by Google Cloud. Essentially, it allows you to build containers right inside the cluster. Uh, it's a, so Canico is like a container image for building container images. There's an actual Canico image. And what happens is it ex the image will execute the Docker, the, you know, the, the Docker builds, Docker pushes and whatnot. And within your Kubernetes cluster, build an image and deploy it. And so you don't need to worry about a specific type of Docker daemon or anything like that. Supports your standard Docker file format, so no surprises there. At this point in time, it does not support Windows containers. Uh, I can't say that it never will. I'm sure as the you know a demand goes up there, and it might. Um, it is also open source, so you know if anybody has extra cycles to help develop this, uh, please by all means join in. Now. 
one thing we also have to think about is iterating on top of our code, on top of our Kubernetes deployments. You know, day one application is going to look one way. Day 500 application is going to go through a lot of different changes, a lot of different patches. Um, heck, there might even be some changes um, uh, within the actual Kubernetes API over the course of two years that you might benefit, like, you know, how we have just had the Gateway API alpha the other day or last month. You know, maybe you want to take advantage of that for the new version of the application. How do we actually iterate our application to where it can constantly change without it just becoming a mess of YAML? Well, that's where Customize come in. Customize is a Kubernetes SIG project. It is essentially a, I, it's, I, I refrain, it's, it's kind of templating, but kind of not. It's essentially creating configs and then it, it builds on top of it. You could do, do a def, uh, dynamic resource build. It's actually built into kubectl now so in the past you had to download the customize program and customize build yada 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 now as of i want to say 1.14 it is actually a part of kubectl cube cuddle cube control let's not get into that um apply dash k to do the build and it is not a traditional packing packaging tool in the same way you'd probably think of maybe say like helm um it's more of a way to organize your config configurations and make it easier to iterate on new versions, create different patches and so on. So what you would do is you would create your normal resources. So you create your deployment files, your services, config maps, all that stuff. And then you'd create a customize.yaml. That customize.yaml essentially declares what is needed for the build so it needs these resources it's going to do this going to do that then of course you have your overlay now this is where things get interesting because overlay allows you to add patches on top of what is already deployed so you've set the customized base which is the base application what you originally deployed and then from there you can create a patch like let's say I want to increase the amount of CPU used on a given pod or a new uh, a, a new uh, deployment to be part of there. And then of course, name the resources. So just kind of a high level overview, which comes from the GitHub, GitHub repository. You know, I can have some app, this is my directory and I have the base app. So this is the base code. I create an overlays directory and now I have a development application and a production application. So on top of, it, for the overlays, if I wanna do a development or a production push, the customize.yaml will take these default base applications, the base deployment, the base service. And then on top of that, it will deploy a different CPU count or replica count for development than it will for production. So a lot of times people find this easier. I'm not necessarily trying to say that it is a replacement for Helm or JSON or Scaffold or whatever tool you may be using today. It's really just a different way of thinking of things. I know sometimes charts can become difficult as time progresses and you start adding more to them. This makes it a little easier to iterate on top of it. But then again, it's just, it is a tool. It's not the tool. Uh, it's one that I like to use though, because I find it easier to manage the code long-term. Building a pipeline. So as we mentioned, we have the reusable task, we have the reusable pipelines. What I can do is I can take a, uh, for this example, we're doing a Go, I, I can run a Go test when I push the code. So here's my pipeline here, all the tasks. You know, I push my code here, run a Go test, build the image, we can also scan the image based on whatever parameters we set. If the scan, if the scan completes, move forward. If the scan fails, stop and give us an error. Deploy to Canary. So there are actually a lot of good use cases with Tecton of people using Istio to do Canary deployments. Uh, I do not have that in the demo, but I am going to continuously iterate on top of the GitHub repo I have. So at some point, it will be there. And then of course, once the analysis is done, do some kind of deploy. As you can see, you know, it's not a singular line. There's some branching that takes place here. So you are able to program some responses in there. 
uh, some kind of intelligence to where if X happens, do this, do that, uh, so on and so forth, which is awesome. And basically, this is what it can also look like. So here I am. I'm writing code, pushing to a Git repo. I have my Tecton pipeline. Canico is building the actual container, turning the code into a container, pushing it to our our uh, container registry, whatever it is you want to use, use that, whether it's Artifactory, Docker Hub, uh, uh, GitHub, there's too many, there's so many to name. Then customize the deploy and hey, I have a happy application. Let's see what that looks like practically actually. Give me one second. This is always the fun part, like jumping from one screen to the next. So while I do that, let me see if there are any questions in the chat. Yes, I am going to share a repo in the slides. I am putting a, uh, I'm working backwards here. In the slides, I am putting the uh, bit.ly link to my repo. Uh, let's see. Can customize be used with Helm? I believe so. I've personally never done it, but I've heard people do that. Uh, can I increase the font size? Sorry, I already no. um, in the URL. You'll have the slides. So, all right. Let's see here. And then I also, just as a side note too, as somebody mentioning integrating Helm with with Customize, I heard of people doing that, as I mentioned. I've never personally done it. Uh, that being said, because uh, what we're talking about is components to build a pipeline, I don't see any reason why you couldn't do that, realistically. On top of that, I've seen people use Tecton with other CD tools uh, to do specific tasks, such as uh, people doing uh, Tecton to Argo to push Helm charts and and whatnot. <clears throat> so, all right, so let me share. So let me share my repo first because we have people asking about code. All right, let me try to expand the font here. Yeah, there we go. Let me see what it looks like in the live webinar. Let me do one more. Perfect. Oops, maybe that's a little too big because I can't see everything in it. There we go. So here we have my different Tecton components. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about each one individually. So first, let's talk about resources. Resources are the items that we're going to pass along in the pipeline. So in this example, I mean, you can have multiple resources, but in this example, I'm wanting to tell it, okay, this is where the Git repository is for where my code lives that I want you to build. And then this is saying, this is what I want, this is what the resulting image should look like. And here, obviously, I can replace that with whatever. But yeah, so here's what the image should look like when all said and done. When I jump back to tasks, I have a build task, which is the one I showed earlier. Set some parameters such as the Docker file path. So basically, Workspace is, is um, I should have mentioned this earlier, Workspace is uh, essentially a, a part on the volume while, it's, while the container is running in the pod where it will store the code temporarily while it is doing the build. Obviously, when it's pulling code down and trying to do a build, it needs the code to live somewhere, so that will be your workspace. Um, here I have an app directory, a Docker file, a source path, where's the source code, can of context, context, and then here are the inputs. So it's input, I'm telling it, okay, go to this Git repository, in that resource I showed you earlier, output, create this image. It's gonna run a test, and then it's gonna use, as you can see, the Canico project, uh, image called executor, executor or executor, I guess, tomato, tomato. And then it will use kind of code to, to essentially run this command to 
build and push the container to a specific registry where, where I listed image. Deploy, pretty much the same thing, only it's deploying code. So as you can see, I have the apply K there. Uh, and this is using a kubectl image. So basically this is a Docker image uh, or container image that exists purely for the purpose of executing kubectl commands. And Google offers a lot of different ones and there's just a lot of different ones out there. And of course, as I mentioned, you can create your own. If you don't like what this kubectl one does, you can, you can customize it and put it in your own registry or create something entirely different. Now, this is not necessarily best practice, uh, largely because if you deploy this way, it's hard to know who owns what, but this is just kind of for demo purposes, so it doesn't matter. Um, there are different ways to do this. And then, of course, we have the pipeline, which is, I've showed earlier now, interesting thing here that I didn't talk about. We have this concept called run. Uh, you have task runs, pipeline runs, and then there's some new versions that are being tested yet now to kind of replace some of the resources, but it's it's not uh, important at this point in time. This is basically saying, okay, th this is what's telling the, the pipeline to execute because we don't want the pipeline to just randomly run. A, a pipeline run uh, as a file here, as a sim single file, if I do a kubectl apply to this file, it will essentially tell the pipeline, oh, trigger. So this is like a way to manually trigger things. But what if I want to automatic automatically trigger things? So we have a listener. And here's our event listener, as I mentioned, I gave it a name. Uh, because I don't want just anybody accessing and sending a payload to my GitHub repo and or sending a payload to my event listener and getting it to do whatever it is, I put in a secret. I give it a, a the value, like what kind of event type. You can use any event type that is provided by your Git repository. You, you have to read their documentation though, because I know like GitLab and GitHub have different or they name them differently anyway. The binding and the template that it's gonna use, service account for security purposes and the resources. You can actually set resource limits for the containers. This is what's binding and what it's gonna grab from the URL, uh, from the JSON payload from the uh, trigger event is it's gonna pull the uh, Git revision and the Git repository URL and pass it along to the trigger template. Trigger template will then essentially is the trigger template is essentially a pipeline run or a task run so you're essentially saying okay the the event happened what do i want it to do next it's pretty straightforward but it's pretty nice too and it's nice because you can just build on top of things and real quick so you might have noticed that i had the app on there so just simple app so as you can see i have a docker file it's just going to look at get the git repository which is this app and then do the build uh let's see here and then there's some manifest so nothing too exciting but as you can see here's a customized.yaml file very basic uh, but it's declaring the resources it's matching with a specific application and these are just simple resources for a hello world application and now, and I do need to update the README. There's actually a script that I wrote that automates it, and I'm essentially just going to decompose it into the README. So uh, bear with me on that one. And while I connect to my cloud registry here. Let me see if there are any other questions. Uh, oh, thank you for using Tecton and Argo CD. Uh, uh, so your question about uh, Tecton positioned as a tool to build other CI CD tools, yes and no. Um, I would say that yes, it still fits that category in the sense that in the sense that you can 
build on if you look at tecton as being a platform for ci cd then you can build your own ci cd tools on top of it so you, such as jenkins x and whatnot however the individual building blocks of tecton could be used to build its own pipeline i've seen both use cases so i've seen people extend um their jenkins using the jx plugin to do specific use cases but i also have seen some people who have just used um, straight tecton to do all their deployments there's no right or wrong way really the point here is that we're giving you the basic components to build what you need to do so there are some people who only use tecton for the ci component and then use argo or flux for cd there's some people who use tecton for both ci and cd there's some people who just use it for testing there's no right or wrong answer for it uh, it's supposed to be the components, and yeah, there's a lot of people just build on top of that. Uh, I see te Tecton mainly on CI. Jenkins X is good, ba is based on good ideas, but actually have never been stable. And uh, for CD, you you see, yeah, as I mentioned, there are people who actually do that. Uh, it's a very common use case, and yeah, from a security perspective, there's definitely a benefit of using Tecton with with Argo CD for the kubectl uh, apply of uh, customize. Uh, so how would you bootstrap Tecton without external CI CD solutions? Um, if you can give me more information on that, I would be able to give you an answer. Uh, but yes, let's see here. Let's jump into this screen and then I'll show you what I've got. Oh, well, I see this question just pop up. Is it best practice to use Tecton in the same cluster with a different namespace? Yes. I would say that's the preferred way to do it. Um, a lot of people I've noticed, so one of the greatest use cases I've seen of Tecton, uh, just in my field and whatnot, is people who want to build on cluster. So people who don't want to have to reach outside to go to a third party to do their CI CD uh, you know they're already having to reach out to like a git repository granite you can like deploy GitLab or git t or whatnot in a cluster but there's a lot of people who want to have like just everything inside of the cluster so we I've seen people use say git t or GitLab deploy that in, into their Kubernetes cluster on one namespace and then deploy Tecton in the same namespace their code never leaves the Kubernetes cluster but then of course for security purposes they are back and all that fun stuff. Uh, let's see to deploy our If you don't have a system like say GitLab to deploy to Kate because I do it with Tecton, how I deploy it initially. Um, you can Oh, if you can elaborate on that a little bit, I've used Spinnaker, but manage that the pipeline specs through Terraform. Yep, that um, cool. All right, so let's jump to this real quick. All right, so now I'm I'm using GKE because you know I work for Google and I have I have access to my Google Cloud platform and whatnot. But I want you to know. It does it, Kubernetes is Kubernetes. You can use Tecton and anything. You can use my Git repository on pretty much anything. And if you find that there is some kind of weird, you know, feature that I'm not noticing, just let you know, create a GitHub issue and we'll make it work. All right. So what do I have here? I'm gonna go ahead and actually show you the Tecton cluster. Nothing interesting to see here today, of course, until I actually go through and set up Tecton, which you can do by running these simple commands. So here's just installing the pipeline. As I mentioned, they were all different components. Tecton's also uh, evolved, or at least the trigger portion has evolved a little bit to where it is able to use um, 
to where there's some built-in interceptors like for very common event types. So GitHub, GitLab, all of that. Uh, we're going a little slower than I thought, but you know it happens. If anything, I'll just go back to ask answering questions. I don't know if anybody's ever had it where you just have like a random epiphany of uh, of what to do to to um, to improve a demo, and then you just do it, but then it didn't actually make anything better. It's always a fun experience. So there's this Tecton CLI, which is oops. Oh, I installed the wrong one. I installed the Mac version eh, on a Linux machine. There we go. All righty then. And then, actually, I need to set another variable. But basically, actually, I don't think I do. So let me go ahead and take a look at our Tecton files. I think I need to replace the variable in one of them, resources. Uh, oh, wait. Coffee hasn't fully kicked in. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. I usually like to just build it um, one piece at a time. Uh, makes it a little easier. So let's jump. Oh, wait. Yeah, I want to be in Tecton. So let's do some kubectl. Let's apply the resources first. All right. And I have the tasks and the same tasks that I showed you earlier. So I'll go ahead and apply those. All right, now I'm gonna apply the pipeline and components individually. So, let's take a look. So in the past, you would just have to run the logs to find, figure out what's going on in the build, but because of the Tecton CLI tool, uh, pipeline wrong, uh, list. I can actually list that, and hey, it failed. That's always fun. Yep, I made a fun change, but hey, we can also diagnose real time because all we do is Tecton, pipe, Tecton Pipeline Run Logs. Okay, so Git's removing from the task run there. Didn't I deploy it earlier? I'm pretty sure I did. If there is like a bug, I'll fix it. And that way you guys will have it available for actually trying um, in real time uh, later today. And I'm also going to continue iterating on this. So hopefully, you know, in the future, we'll have stuff about, you know, uh, uh, how to do canary analysis and whatnot. Uh, yeah, I created a Git task. I'm pretty confident. Huh. Oh, well. Um, might also just be a weird setting. Mm. You know, it's always something, I guess. Well, because I want to get to your questions, I will go ahead and just jump back to the slides and we will do Q&A and then we will take it from there. So let's do this. All right. Oh, somebody's deployed Tecton on K3S. I have never tried that, and that sounds interesting. Oh, so you can, well, so for us, the, all the resources, you can do a, tech, a TKN, um, what's the word, actually? It's a TKN, and then there's it lists a bunch of different things that you can list. So you can list resource, you can list task, you can list task run. So in fact, let me go ahead and just show you. I'm still learning this whole screen share on this uh, platform, so bear with me. All 
So here I run the tecton command. And as you can see, in fact, here, let me, there we go. As you can see, I have this resource option. So I can just do like tecton resource. Okay, tecton resource list, describe, create, delete. So it lists my resources. Uh, but I can do that with just about anything. I can list the event list or cluster tasks, trigger binding, uh, conditions, all of that good stuff. Let's see here. We've used Argo CD to deploy both the Tecton operator and a pipeline, simplifies management. That's good. Is there a debug functionality that allows you to connect and execute steps inside the build container? I know Circle C. Uh, I do not have an answer for that. I I don't know if it exists today. If it doesn't, I would be willing to bet that there are some tools or there's probably a pull request or something on that. Does Tecton run on Minikube and Kind to test locally? You can't, uh, I've never tried it on Minikube. I've tried it on Kind, you can. Uh, at the end of the day, Kubernetes is Kubernetes. So, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, I just run on GK just because, you know, work for Google. It's, I mean, one, I like GK, but I work for Google, so it's easy for me to get access to it. But this can just as easily be anything else. I mean, I've, I actually have a, a Kubernetes cluster running on like eight different Raspberry Pis, and I've run it there uh, using Kube AD, ADM. So, you know, Kubernetes is Kubernetes. Uh, let's see, some CD tools use convention of YAML. Have you seen a common patterns for organizing pipeline definitions? Um, not off the top of my head. So in theory, you could even use like customize. Ironically, you could probably use customize to define all the resources to deploy Kubernetes, uh, to deploy Tecton and manage like the pipeline files. So that would be a, an option. Uh, let's see here. Tecton with ARM, yeah, I'm pretty confident it's possible to do that. Yep. Um, what's the pattern people follow for this setup? Get Hub accessible only in on-prem, and you need to deploy to the cloud. Usually service account keys, things like that. Um, just to authenticate, give the right permissions. Um, then you recommended way to store Kubernetes secrets in the Git repo. Um, so I don't know if... I don't know if there's a best practice for storing secrets. So like in my, obviously I'm not following best practices because in my version, if you actually look at my secret file, there's a, the, the, there's the password, but it's also, I don't you know really care. It's howdy y'all. Uh, but you, there are a few different ways to manage secrets. So you can use like a secret manager, such as what you might see from different vendors. Uh, and there's also other Kubernetes way. Uh, let's see here, any other questions? So we have a we have about ten more minutes. So if anybody has questions, I'll be happy to answer them as best as I can. Otherwise, cut you guys loose and get back to your lovely Tuesday. Yes, there is a dashboard. It is still relatively new, but I uh, it is being built upon. And you know, it didn't exist a while ago, so it's kind of nice that to see that it is kind of going that direction and. Hopefully, you know, it is an open source project. So obviously it goes kind of through the same open source uh, struggles that a lot of people go through, like just people committing time. That being said, you know, Google, IBM, um, Salesforce, a lot of different companies are contributing to uh, Tecton. So, and quite frankly, are using them internally. So I can only expect to see better things coming down the way. Uh, so here is where the Tecton dashboard is. Uh, I dropped it in the chat. Best practices for organizing, it really depends. What I do is just, uh, I, I tend to live in the world of folders and subfolders. So I might have a subfolder called like tasks and that's every task, but then within that folder, I'll have subtasks like this is my, uh, these are tasks related to building on my development branch. These are the tasks related to building on and so on and so forth. 
Um, so the very, the very basic Tekton is the Tekton pipeline. Like that was, that was like the first component to be deployed as part of Tekton. Everything's built up on it. I usually recommend, it really depends on what you're going for. You only need Tekton triggers if you want to have, if you want to have automated triggers to happen. So somebody pushes to a Git repository or something like that, then you can install triggers. That being said, you can just use manual pipeline runs or task runs to, to trigger things if you want to. You know, it's, it's up to you. Um, it depends on what makes sense. I know automation is what most people are going for, which makes it better to have the trigger. But if you want to run everything manually, then you can forego it. I do recommend using the CLI tool because it just makes it easier to view logs and what's going on. Uh, as far as the dashboard, that's purely a personal preference thing. I honestly barely use it. Uh, but if you want to, go for it. Uh, that would probably be the vast majority of all the tools that you would actually need to deploy to use Tekton. Uh, that being said, I think there are some new features that are coming out. Uh, so there's like the Tekton catalog, as I mentioned, and there are some, I think, Tekton chains, which is security related. Uh, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different things coming down the, the way as well, uh, coming down the pipeline. Uh, I do not have the, oh, I do have, did I deploy it? I don't think I deployed the uh, ta dashboard. It's a separate component, so I can't really share that because it's not installed. I believe it does. Can I'm not familiar with that product. I'm going to look it up later. I always like learning about new uh, fun open source projects. And any other questions that we have? Otherwise, give you guys back seven minutes. No? Okay. Well, I, I want to thank you all for your time. Um, follow me on Twitter. Follow me on LinkedIn. The uh, As you can see here, the slide deck does have a, a bit.ly link to my GitHub repo. I'm going to constantly iterate on top of it because I just like sharing, you know, name of open in the name of open source. It's always good to share, create demos, all that good stuff. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jason. Thanks everyone for joining. And like I said, the recording and slides will be online later today. And we'll see you at a future CNCF webinar. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you.